It's now time for a question period. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. The release of the Metrolinx report yesterday opened up a whole new realm of taxes and fees for Ontario's taxpayers. You may call them revenue tools, but a tax is a tax is a tax. These taxes will cost the average family $1,000 per year. Low-income students who don't even drive will get taxed $140 a year, and seniors on fixed incomes will be taxed $120 a year. Premier, why don't you do the hard work of combing through your budget to find $2 billion worth of savings before you go to your automatic default provision and hit Ontario families, seniors and students with yet another tax? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And to paraphrase my colleague, the Minister of Training, Colleges and University, congestion is congestion is congestion, Mr. Speaker. And the reality is that we are going to have to deal with the congestion in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. The reason we're going to have to deal with that, Mr. Speaker, is that for decades there has not been the work done that should have been done. That's the reality. We are playing catch up, Mr. Speaker. There are projects that were started. There was a, a line that was to be built along the Eglinton, uh, along Eglinton, Mr. Speaker, the hole was dug, the hole was filled in by the previous government, Mr. Speaker. If that, if that subway had been built, it would be running today, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I'm going to start right off. Um, normally, I have to deal with it. Stop the clock for a moment. Normally, I have to uh, deal with the opposition while the premier is speaking. Now, I'm dealing with members of her own cabinet and her own side heckling while she's trying to answer and and that that doesn't change anything it doesn't change anything i'm asking for some uh, spiral up instead of down so if those people that want to heckle they better be in their seat so that i can tell them to stop heckling and i think somebody's got my message Finish, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And to to respond, uh, the point I'm making is that there has been uh, a neglect of this file for many years. When Answer. we came into office in 2003, we started building transit, Mr. Speaker. We need to keep going. That's why we need an investment strategy. The reality is, your government managed to find two million two billion dollars to pay. Connected e-health consultants. You found another billion dollars to cancel two gas plants. Heck, you even found a couple million dollars to buy Chris Maz a speedboat. Premier, based on your government's track record, surely you can find two billion dollars if you do the hard work of combing through the budget. If transit is truly one of your government's priorities. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And let's let's talk about what we're actually what we actually need to do here. This is a $50 billion plan, Mr. Speaker. It's over a couple of decades in the future. We need to continue the building that is going on right now in the GTHA, and we need to build out to that broader plan. This is an annual investment that needs to be made, Mr. Speaker. And the reality is that that kind of commitment has not been made in this province, and we need now to recognize that our economic economic growth and our economic stability, quite frankly, is at stake because every year we're losing billions of dollars in productivity by not having that transit in place, Mr. Speaker. So we need to work on people's quality of life. We need to recognize that building transit affects people's daily order. lives, and that's why we need to make these Thank investments, you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Premier, this is ultimately about your government's priorities. Over the last 10 years, you have consistently spent money on your partisan priorities and not those of the average Ontarians. Your government does not have a revenue problem. You've got a management problem. It's time to do right by Ontarians. Show some leadership. Will you promise us today in this legislature and the people of Ontario that you will not implement these new taxes and you will do your job and find $2 billion annually from the existing budget going forward? Mr. Speaker, this most certainly is about our priorities, and I am very proud of our priorities. Our priorities are. Here, here. Our priorities are and have been to make sure that we deliver the services that people need every single day. Our priorities.
priorities are making sure that we have the teachers in our schools that kids need, making sure that we have the doctors and the nurses and the nurse practitioners and the midwives that people need in their lives, Mr. Speaker, making sure that the infrastructure that has been neglected in this province for decades is built, Mr. Speaker. I am proud of those priorities, and the reality is that this province has needed a dedicated plan for building transit and repairing and building infrastructure for years. They haven't had it. We're going to put it in place, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to provide that infrastructure that's needed in the future for the children and grandchildren that's in this province, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Premier, in looking through the gas plant scandal Treasury Board documents last week, it would appear that your uh, whiteout team Order. missed a few gems. In the House Leader's note, Carry on, please. Thank you, Speaker. Here's uh, uh, in the uh, House Leader's notes for last year's budget meeting to buy the support of the NDP. The last sentence reads, and I quote, the proposals should be enough to avoid an election. Oh, That's your you. government's sole mission, yeah. to stay in power at all costs. <laughs> Premier, how can you find a billion dollars to buy NDP support, a billion dollars to cancel gas plants, a billion dollars to subsidize hydro bills, a billion dollars for e-health consultants, but you can't find a billion dollars to build new subways and highways? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we have found billions of dollars to invest in subways, Mr. Speaker, and in transit, and in light rail, and in roads and bridges, Mr. Speaker, across the GTHA and across the province. Every single year, we have invested billions of dollars in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. And let me just be clear in terms of the work that we have done around the relocation of the gas plants and why, Mr. Speaker, I believe that being open and transparent is exactly what was necessary. And working in collaboration with the people in the in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, I ran in my leadership on that. So the notion that somehow working in collaboration with the opposition and working to put forward a budget that would allow us to continue to govern in a minority parliament and continue to work with the, the folks across the floor, I think that's our responsibility, yes, Mr. Speaker. I think that's what I said. It is what I said when I ran in the leadership. It is what we've been doing, and we're going to continue to work with you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, for the cost of your gas plant scandal, which your own Treasury Board says will reach close to a billion dollars, you could have built the entire length of the Eglinton Crosstown, or you could have paid for 40 kilometres of dedicated bus rapid transit connecting Burlington, Oakville and Mississauga with a BRT direct to Kipling. In your $127 billion budget, if you found just 2 per cent of savings across the entire government, you would have $2.5 billion a year. That's your $2 billion for your big move and $500 million left over to pay down debt. Premier, we don't have a revenue problem in Ontario. You have a spending problem. Why do Liberals always default to new taxes to solve Ontario's problems? Mr. Speaker, the... Thank you. Uh, the member from Renfrew, nice and easy. I'm talking to you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it, you know, it's an interesting line of questioning because the, the same Don't line help. of questioning is used when uh, when the members opposite talk about investment in education. The same line of questioning is used when the members opposite use uh, ask about investment from in health. Member from Dufferin, Mr. Calvin, because come the reality order. is that they would cut all of those they would cut those services across the board, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. We have been working very hard to constrain costs, Mr. Speaker. We know that you know we know that. Eliminating the deficit is extremely important. We're on track to do that by 2017-18. But in the interim, Mr. Speaker, we cannot ignore we cannot ignore the reality that if we are going to have the economic growth that we need, if we're going to be able to take our place in the global economy, we've That's got right. to invest in infrastructure, Absolutely. particularly 
in the GTHA because we're losing productivity because of the lack of infrastructure. So, Thank you. making those investments in transit is the economically Thank sound you. thing Absolutely. to do, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Final supplementary. Speaker, uh, Premier London Economics International, a globally respected independent economic uh, consultancy, said your feed-in tariff program and green energy subsidies will cost $46 billion. In other words, it's roughly the cost of the entire big move, yet it hasn't increased green energy production one bit. How do you explain to Scarborough, Scarborough residents that you now need even more money from them, yet they still won't get subways? How do you explain to the people elsewhere in the GTHA that their energy bills will continue to skyrocket, their gas bills will go up, their HST will go up, all because of Liberal mismanagement? And Premier, on a personal note, how can you explain to the residents of, more Ontario, of northern Ontario that you can't afford Ontario Northland? Premier, how can Ontarians trust you with even Thank one you. more nickel of their money? Thank you. There was a lot in that question. I wouldn't know who to refer to even if I was choosing to, so I will, I will answer the question, Mr. Speaker. So on the, I just, I just want to speak to the, to the issue of the Ontario Northland because, Mr. Speaker, I, I want, I want the people of North Bay and the people of uh, northeastern Ontario to know that Minister Gravel is working very hard to bring those northeastern voices into the discussion around Ontario Northland. He has made a commitment that the advisory panel will look at what the options are and make sound decisions on that issue. And I think that it's very, you know, it's, it's very good to have a question from the member opposite on the issue because it's, it's important to me that we have a rational transportation plan for northern Ontario, northeastern and northwestern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we need to invest in transit in the GTA. Yes, there is no question about that. The members opposite are working undermine that reality. Okay, we'll start. The member from Halton is warned. Finish please. And the member from Renfrew. Is that enough? Thank you. Carry All on. the questions so far from the members opposite have not acknowledged the reality that we need to build transit in the GTHA. We have to do that. There's really no debate about that, Mr. Speaker, and we're working Answer. our level best to find a way to make those investments. Thank you. Your question? The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. New Democrats have been working hard to make life more affordable for people by giving Fisco a mandate to lower auto insurance rates by 15 per cent. Would the Premier agree that raising insurance Minister rates by 30 per cent before lowering them is not a measure that will make life more affordable for drivers? And very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, we need to get the budget passed. There's no doubt about that because we have said in the budget that we are going to work to reduce uh, auto insurance premiums by 15%. Mr. Speaker, we said we want to get on that right away. And the reality is that until we get the budget passed, Mr. Speaker, we can't implement the budget. So I look forward to the debate on the budget. I look forward to moving uh, moving ahead and being able to implement it. And a, and a part of that is helping people in their day-to-day -day lives. And one aspect of that is lowering those insurance premiums, Mr. Speaker. Right. So we want to get the budget through the legislature. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Susan Wright is a driver from Bramalee, and she just got her notice that her auto insurance premiums are going up by more than 30 per cent. Her driving record has not changed, Speaker. She hasn't had sudden accidents or claims on her insurance policy. She's one of several people who have contacted us about premiums that suddenly seem to be rising just Pivot as the from government North is and come to, order. to take some action. The member from Northumberland, come to order, please. Please put the question. Can the Premier explain to drivers like Susan why her government right now is, in, is approving massive increases at the same time as they're promising to provide a cut in rates? Minister of Finance. Mr. Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. Rates have actually reduced by 0.3% year over year since last year. What we're doing right now, we're asking Fisco to take controls and measures appropriately to ensure 
that rates do not go up. We recognize, and, I, and, and the member opposite makes reference to a specific case, and I don't know the particulars of that individual, but I do know this. We need to get this budget passed. We need to ensure that we give fiscal the powers necessary. We need to provide legislation and provide the oversight that we all agree in order that we can reduce rates, in order that we also go after the root causes of the fraud that's also there. So we're working towards that. We've taken the measures over the last two years to reduce some of that fraud. It's translated in certain reductions of some of the uh, auto rates. Answer. More needs to be done. I agree with the member opposite. We cannot allow rates to go up at this time. Let's get this budget passed, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Let's be clear, Speaker. What needs to be done is this government, the government needs to tell the auto insurance industry they can't put rates up. That's what needs to be done. justifiably skeptical. They have heard government promises to cut auto insurance premiums by 15 percent. At the same time, at the same time, right now, Speaker, drivers are getting 30 percent increases on their renewals. New Democrats want to make sure that good drivers pay less next year than they're paying today. Will the government commit to protecting drivers like Susan from increases before the decreases? Now, Mr. Speaker, of course we're committed. We put it in the budget. We made it clear that's exactly what we want to do. We've already assessed the fact that rates have gone down on average, not up. If I have to go to the individuals immediately and do so, I've done it, and I will do it again. It is too much. Answer, please. And some of the measures that we're asking for is to appoint a review for any dispute resolutions, as the member opposite just made reference to. We want to continue in the definitions of certain impairments. We've already started uh, discussions with a number of initiatives and stakeholders around the province. We want to make certain that claims are reviewed. It's part of our budget. It's part of our request. We also know in our discussions with those insurance companies, we've been very direct in Answer. telling them to maintain the rates at what they are. They've actually been lowered on average by 0.3%. We need to get this budget passed. We need to work together. Let's not make reference to one individual case that we don't know the particulars of. And it's unfair Thank for you. the member opposite to. Thank you. Thank you. It's enough. New question. The leader of the third party. My next question is to the Premier Speaker. New Democrats have been very clear. We don't think it's fair to ask families to pay new tolls and taxes at the same time as the government is opening new tax loopholes for corporations. I asked the Premier about whether she would work with, uh, with Ottawa to close her new corporate tax loophole. Yesterday, the Minister of Finance said, and I quote, we've had this discussion and we're continuing to do so, unquote. What's the status of that discussion, Speaker? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Finance will want to speak to the specifics of that uh, of that contact with Ottawa. And I think that the uh, the leader of the third party knows that we do not have full control over those mechanisms, which is why we have to work with Ottawa. And that's why the letter has been written. And I'll let the finance minister speak to those specifics. But, Mr. Speaker, at the root of this question, again is a question about whether the third party supports the building of transit in the GTHA. It seems to me, Mr. Speaker, that the members in that party understand very well how critical that infrastructure is to the economy of this region. Also understand very well, Mr. Speaker, that the quality of life of the people who live in the GTHA, the moms who are trying to get their kids to school and to daycare and back home again, yes, the dads who are driving on the highway, Mr. Speaker, they know that there needs to be a responsibility taken by government to make those investments. I hope the third party will work with us, Mr. Thank Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what we understand very well over here is that the Premier is planning to open a brand new corporate tax loophole that will ensure corporations can write the HST off on gasoline and other items. But on the other hand, she's musing about making families pay a new gasoline tax. Does the Premier think that's fair, that families Sir, should pay more and corporations should pay less yet again? Mr. Speaker, I, just, I really have to just say that we have said many, many times in this legislature, both I and the Minister of Finance, that 
the characterization of that relationship on the tax, uh, the tax uh, regime with the federal government is just not accurate. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we have written to the federal government. We have said that we would like to extend the situation as it exists now. It is not a new loophole, Mr. Speaker. It's not a loophole. It's something that was uh, that was negotiated Member with from the federal Bruce government Sound when we changed the tax system, Mr. Speaker. So we will continue to work with the federal government on this. But, Mr. Speaker, I think the question that we do have to, to grapple with is, is the third party going to support the investment in transit in the GTHA? We know it's needed for people in Answer. their day-to-day -day lives. We know it's necessary for the economy. We need their support on that investment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, let's be clear about what this looks like. The Premier's new corporate tax loophole will make sure that if two cars roll up to the pump at the same time, the executive in the company car won't have to pay the HST, and the mum with the kids in the minivan will. In fact, the Premier goes forward with, if the Premier goes forward with the gas tax, it means that the mum in the, in the minivan is going to be paying more and more and more. The Premier is ready to ask families to pay more, Speaker, while she tells corporations to pay less. Does she really think that that's a balanced approach? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. So as the member opposite asks, let's be clear, and let us be clear. You're talking about restricted input tax credits. It's not a loophole. It's not a tax break, it's not a tax giveaway, and it's not new. We have written the Minister of uh, Finance federally to extend that exemption, as we all agree, in order for us to continue meeting our balance, in order for us to do what's necessary to protect uh, the interests of our taxpayers. But we agree that we want to have these extended, but we also recognize that it has to be done in tandem with the federal government. Yeah, we can't do it alone. What's happening is if, if they get a tax rebate or, or, or in 2017-18, because they're all relative to other different issues, because it's not just vehicles and it's not just meals and entertainment, it's also telecommunications and it's also with regards to energy. So yes, all of this is coming up. We're asking them to have them extended. It's not a tax loophole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question? A member from Newmarket, Aurora. My, uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, it took five years for Metrolinx to deliver a funding proposal for its transit plan. And the best that they could do is to come up with a proposal to add $2 billion in taxes onto the backs of Ontario taxpayers. Member from Eglinton and Lawrence, Speaker, come to order, please. please. Reject that proposal. Ontario families and businesses reject that proposal. Even the New Democrats reject that proposal. The Premier tells us she wants to have a conversation about adding $2 billion of taxes to Ontario families and businesses. Here is our proposal. While the Premier is having her conversation, will she agree to a select committee of this legislature Question. that has a mandate to find $2 billion of savings out of the waste and inefficiency that is rampant Thank you. throughout this government. And come to order. Start the clock. Premier. An infrastructure. Transportation and infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. It, it, it's an interesting question that's being asked from a member who. In just, I could go through numerous decisions of the, of the party opposite in power, Mr. Speaker, but the $7 billion loss on the fire sale of the 407, the $8 billion in stranded debt. There's $15 billion that just comes to me like that, Mr. Speaker. You guys majored in wasting money on a scale unprecedented by anybody who ever sat on this side of the House. We need no lessons, Mr. Speaker, from the members opposite on multi-billion dollar disasters. We can't hold a candle to them if we tried, Mr. Speaker. 
but their record on transit, Mr. Speaker, and their neglect of it is legendary across North America, Mr. Speaker. When they were in power, you cannot Answer. find a subnational government that so abandoned transit, so critical to young people in our jobs. They froze funding for GO Transit, Thank Mr. You. Speaker, and the lineups all along Thank the lakeshore you. line, Mr. Speaker, were legendary. Thank you. Supplementary. For a nonpartisan approach to solving this problem. <laughs> Speaker, Speaker, the budget, the budget. Order, please. So, trying to uh, understand the psychology of the situation, this is where I get the emails that often tell me, "Why don't you just throw the bums out?" And uh, and having the armchair quarterbacks advising me on how to do that. I'm not taking your advice because I honestly believe we can race to the top. Finish your question, please. Speaker, I find the government's reaction to that comment very passing strange. It's the, it's the Premier who made that suggestion that we should be approaching this on a nonpartisan basis. Speaker, the budget of this government is $127 billion. The waste is rampant. We all know that. One year it's e-health, the next year it's orange, the year after that it's gas plants. We know, all of us in this place, on all three sides of the House, know there is a great deal of inefficiency and waste. I'm going to repeat my question to the Premier, question? not the Minister of Transportation. Will she agree to strike a select committee of this House with a mandate? to find the waste and inefficiency of $2 billion so that we can fund transit. Mr. Mr. Speaker, if the party opposite, if the party opposite and some of the members opposite who sat at the cabinet table can point to in their almost decade in power one single transit project they invested in mr speaker i will do a wave and clap for them but they can't what we can point to mr speaker is their brilliant record which was to take bulldozers and fill in the eglinton crosstown line and subway that was their transit record mr speaker this is a party that more single-handedly in government is responsible for the transit crisis we face today mr speaker no party in this legislature has a worse record so while the business community mr speaker while the business community Answer. is begging the party opposite to engage in this conversation from Simcoe, because of the to order. 6 billion dollars they are losing thank you. and while people thank you new question the member from nickelbelt merci monsieur le président ma question pour la ministre Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The expert investigating the diluted chemo drugs. Dr. Thiessen talked about the fact that the outsourcing of drugs for use in hospital has exploded in recent years. And he noted the lack of oversight and said he was worried. My question is simple. Is the minister also worried about this contracting out of hospital drug preparations. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, what's vitally important is that, that we have the highest quality of drugs for all of our patients. And I think we would all agree that cancer patients, in particular, need to have the confidence that they are getting the drugs that have been prescribed for them, Speaker. I am delighted that Dr. Thiessen has taken on this challenge to give us advice on, on the entire cancer drug supply chain. I think members of committee heard yesterday that he's taking that uh, responsibility very, very seriously. He, he will be reporting back to us in coming weeks, Speaker, and I look forward to seeing his report. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, Dr. Thiessen said that in the past he wouldn't have been worried about the preparation of these drugs because most of them 
were being done in our hospital in a highly regulated environment. But as the for-profit industry exploded in Ontario, the needed oversight has not been provided by the Ministry of Health. Speaker, hospitals have been encouraged by this government to move services out, to contract out, often to the for-profit industry. But this change has not been properly done. Will the minister take her responsibility seriously and provide the comprehensive oversight that is her responsibility? Uh, speaker, absolutely. That, that, the, that oversight is essential. That is exactly why I have asked Dr. Thiessen to give us advice on how to ensure the safety of our cancer drug speaker. I think he is a highly qualified person. Uh, I know he is a highly qualified person. He is doing his job thoroughly, Speaker. I do not want to prejudge his findings. I think it's very important that we give him the time he needs to give us a thorough report, and then we will act on that, Speaker. Thank you. New question. A member from Brampton West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Yesterday, Metrolinx, the agency tasked with planning transit expansion in the GTHA, came out with their long-awaited investment strategy report. This report outlined their uh, recommendations on how to pay for transit, and it also talked about the immense cost of congestion and gridlock to Ontarians. Speaker, many of my constituents in Brampton West can spend many hours in traffic or in transit each day. And I must say that many of them are very pleased to hear, the, hear that building public transit is a priority for our government. We can all agree that there is a distinct need to reduce gridlock, improve air quality, and build strong communities. Minister, please tell us on why it's so important for us to move forward and invest in transit projects in the GTHA now. Thank you, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member and uh, our friends from Peel Region uh, uh, for their support on this. Mr. Speaker, this is critical, and I, I just want to stop and pause here and give us a bit of reality on where we're going. We spend less per capita than any other province in Canada, so we have a lower envelope already for all of our basic services, Mr. Speaker. No Member other Bruce jurisdiction, Gray, not Sound. British Columbia, not Alberta, not Quebec, not California, not Oregon, not Massachusetts, no one has built transit without raising some of these revenues. It has never happened. People who tell you that you can build a major regional transportation system without additional revenue are fibbing, Mr. Speaker, and that's a polite word for it. My mother's probably watching. Mr. Speaker, if we don't do this, the business community alone and our residents Answer. will lose $2.7 billion a year. That's the loss of summer jobs for their kids. It's lower household income. It's time away from families, and it's the impossibility of getting a job, because if you don't go to a car, there's no bus to take you, Mr. Speaker. Commentary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, for sharing some of the facts on the cost of gridlock, uh, gridlock on our economy. The Metrolinx report recommended several revenue tools that, that should be used to fund new public transit expansion. Even though the cost of gridlock is esti estimated to be so high and our transit system is in need of a dram dramatic expansion, some of my constituents want to know how some of the proposals might affect them. Now that the report by Metrolinx has been presented to the government, could the minister please tell us on what the government's next steps are? Subway to Brampton. Thank you, Minister. Sir, I, I was talking with my colleague, Minister Jeffrey, Ms., uh, Mr. Speaker. It took her two hours and 15 minutes to get to work from Brampton today. We are the party in this House that thinks that's unacceptable. Her son, Ryan, would like to spend more time with his mom. She already is committed to a, a public life which is taxing enough. Minister Jeffrey's situation, Mr. Speaker, isn't any different. When I am out in Oshawa and in Ajax and Pickering, the Chamber of Commerce, the Residents Association, the regional municipal politicians are saying, get this built. Mr. Speaker, we will make sure that we take as little additional revenue as absolutely possible. We are also understanding that the cost, that that $6 billion is, a, is taxing Answer. Ontario families, and that's real money that they know is missing in opportunities and lower household income. Mr. Speaker, this government stands with the people of the DTHA to improve their Thank quality you. of life, to let their mums spend. 
Thank you. New question. The member from Elgin, Sex, Middle, and London. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Yeah. Minister, in response to my question yesterday over the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, you announced you wanted to explore the possibility of creating local oversight boards at our jails. While I always welcome increased accountability, I also welcomed your 12-point action plan last August because you said it would solve the problems at EMDC. Almost a year later, the violence continues to escalate, threatening the safety of our correctional officers. And now we're saying, well, we actually need a local board that will oversee the implementation of such plans. Minister, you have hundreds of ministry staff, dozens of managers at facilities province-wide, and nearly 150 correctional officers at EMDC alone. How many more people do you need to do your job? Thank you, uh, thank you very much, and I want to uh, thank uh, the, uh, the member uh, from uh, Elgin Middlesex for his, uh, his comment, but his comments are not uh, very appropriate. I, uh, I, as I have said, you know, the safety of our correctional officer and our inmates are my top priority. And in Elgin Middlesex, we have always sent our best manager there. It's, uh, it's uh, a difficult uh, situation right now, and uh, we, uh, we are working very hard with the uh, management there, with the union, with the correctional officer to improve the situation. Yes, and uh, I, uh, we just implemented 24 hours nursing. And we have just also approved 11 new correctional officers. That's good. So on this side of the house, you know, I want to Thank make you. sure that the situation improves at Thank you. Elgin Middlesex Correctional Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Minister, my comments are always appropriate when I'm standing up for my constituents. Yeah. Minister, at the end of the day, the buck does stop with you. Unfortunately, the closure of the Blue Water, Owen Sound, and Walkerton jails overcrowding continues to put a strain on EMDC. When addressing these problems, you waited until receiving multiple lawsuits from inmates and pressure from myself and others to devise your 12-point action plan. You assured us it would work and restore safety to the jail. Then, after a year that included a near riot, a fire, and regular week weekend lockdowns, you announced yesterday another plan to supposedly add more oversight. You keep tossing forward promises and back-of-the-envelope plans while maintaining overcrowding is not the issue. Minister, do you now regret closing the Blue Water, Owen Sound, and Washington facilities? Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we wanted to improve the situation in our correctional facility and to close institutions that were built before Confederation. I'm not going to apologize for that. So, in, there is, and we are working with the, the, uh, with the membership there to improve the, uh, the situation. But one question that I need answer for, it's why he's not Bruce doing his job order. when there is drugs going into the facility? Who is not doing his job when there is, uh, there is knife going into the facility? So that's something that I want an answer, an answer soon. In the meantime, you know, we are looking at appointing uh, a new uh, a board that will help us to Answer. improve the situation there and to have also a better communication with both the, uh, the union, with both uh, with the, the community, and uh, let's Thank hope you. that we will see a major improvement soon in that facility. Thank, Thank you. you. Question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, it's clear that your government's OLG privatization plan is in chaos. You've fired the president and CEO of the OLG, Paul Godfrey, and the entire board of directors has subsequently resigned. Yet you say that it's full steam ahead on this wrong-headed privatization scheme. Will the government admit that its, that its OLG privatization strategy is a total mess and scrap this misguided plan once and for all? 
very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the question and. Uh, what, what we're in the process of doing right now, Mr. Speaker, is there's an interim uh, chair and board in place. Uh, we have said quite clearly that the, there are aspects of the modernization strategy that need to go ahead. We want to have them go ahead, Mr. Speaker. But there are some issues that we really feel need more focus. One was the integration of the horse racing industry into the whole strategy, Mr. Speaker. That was a point of divergence between us and, uh, and the former chair of the board. And the issues, Mr. Speaker, around the fairness across the province. It was very important to us that whatever formula, whatever strategy was put in place was even-handed in terms of its treatment of communities across the province. So those are issues that we are going to have the, the new board will be working on, Mr. Speaker. And you know, we all recognize that there have to be changes in terms of uh, in terms of the OLG and a modernization process. But Mr. Mr. Speaker, we want those two principles to be in place. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, it's, it's time for this government to admit that it has a gambling problem. It's addicted to the revenues that it thinks will pour in from privatizing the OLG. But the government should know, the government should know that the first step in addressing this failure is admitting that you have a problem in the first place. The fact is that it's very unlikely that the projected revenues will ever materialize. Will this government? finally admit that it has a problem and scrap this misguided privatization plan once and for all. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it is interesting, that question coming from the party that brought casinos to the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And so in terms of, in terms of that revenue stream, the reality is the reality is that that revenue stream is part of the revenue that goes into the provincial treasury to pay for schools and hospitals, and it's very important money, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that, but we have to we have to make sure that the industry functions responsibly and functions in a way that is consistent with the principles that we hold. So, Mr. Speaker, I have been very clear that having ho the horse racing industry as part of the gaming strategy, I think, is going to lead to a more sustainable sustainable horse racing industry across the province. That was the recommendation of the transition panel, and that is the recommendation that we are going to be operating on. So we need, we yes, need leadership at the OLG that is going to implement that part of the strategy, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to that work. New question, the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, speaker, my question through you is, is to the uh, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. The Minister, our government recently tabled its 2013 budget, a budget about creating jobs and helping people in their everyday lives. We've put together a strong plan to help people across the province, and this plan will create jobs and give all Ontarians the chance they need to succeed. One of the key elements in our plan is to work with businesses to expand markets for Ontario goods and services beyond the borders of our province so that Ontario businesses can access high growth markets so that they can go global. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, could the minister please inform this House what this government is doing to expand its global economic presence and strengthen Ontario's capacity for innovation and job creation right here Thank at you. home? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, for his question. And I'm pleased to inform the House of a recent announcement our government has made to support innovative businesses and capitalize on emerging opportunities within the global economy. Last week, I visited the riding of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex to announce support from the Ontario government's Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. Mr. Speaker, I was looking forward to uh, standing side by side with the local member, the MPP from Lambton, Kettle, Kent, Middlesex. I invited him to the announcement. And I was, as I mentioned, looking forward to standing side by side, but I was forced to make this announcement on my own. This investment has helped to attract an investment of nearly $3.5 million from Armo Tool, a company specializing in advanced manufacturing. This investment will enable Armo to expand its exports by a third. It will help create Answer. and retain 139 jobs. And Mr. Speaker, it's investments like these that generate the kind of growth that helps us compete not only in the long term, short term, but in the long term. 
Speaker. Thank you, and uh, Minister, thank you for that response. It's good to hear that uh, our government's plan to help create jobs while promoting Ontario on the global stage is working. Speaker, well, it's good to see that the manufacturing sector is developing and that there are many new technologies. We need to make sure Ontario has a competitive edge with these new technologies so that we can compete in the global marketplace. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, could the minister please tell the House how Ontario is helping these new technologies thrive and gain that competitive edge in the global marketplace? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, it is true. Ontario needs to help businesses compete on the global stage. And in fact, I'd, I'd say we have a responsibility as a government to do this. That's why one of my ministry's efforts is on the water sector market, which is a global market that is growing at a very, very rapid pace. Water shortage is becoming, it already is, a global issue due to increasing population and economic growth and climate change. Ontario, we all know, is blessed with incredible fresh water resources, and so we have a strong competitive advantage in the burgeoning blue economy. Last week, I visited with the team at Anderson Water Systems and with Minister McMeekin in his riding of Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Westdale. We announced a funding partnership that will contribute to Ontario's blue economy and help Anderson Water Systems to expand their water treatment facilities and allow them to expand their exports all over the world. Mr. Speaker, our support for Anderson Water Systems is just another testament to our government's commitment to a sustainable and prosperous economy. A member from Lenton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you very much hey, 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 for uh, the Premier. Uh, the Premier, yesterday I brought your attention that you have put 25,000 contact call centre jobs at risk across Ontario due to your rushed decision to cancel the apprenticeship tax credit. This Liberal NDP budget decision will kill thousands of jobs without any consultation. Oh. Premier, yesterday I spoke with Alliance Eye Communications in downtown London. Sadly, with this decision, Alliance is being forced to consider relocating their business and their 300 jobs to the United States. With 600,000 men and women out of work, why are you and the NDP so determined to drive businesses and jobs out of Ontario? Minister of Finance. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, thank you again for the question from across the way. We recognize how important it is to have uh, 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 the apprenticeship training tax credit in the past to promote those initiatives which will stimulate employment and enable those apprentices to have full-time jobs. Exactly. The fact is it's not happening with regards to call centers. However, However, call centers are still eligible for other provincial apprenticeship trade programs. Employers of call center apprentices are eligible to up to $1,000 bonuses for each apprentice who receives and completes their training and receives their certification. We've also introduced in our budget $195 million, Mr. Speaker, for a youth employment fund to enable those companies to hire some of our young people to provide those skills, enable them to have full-time employment as well. We want to work, and I believe the members across are also supportive of recommendations made by Drummond. This is one of them. He's recognizing that some of these investment tax credits are not doing its full extent. We want to Thank do you. the right thing. We want to employ people. Thank we you. want to stimulate that growth. Thank you. Supplementary. Back uh, to the Premier. Premier, North Bay has an 11.3 per cent unemployment rate, and you are putting up to 800 jobs at risk there. London has a 10 per cent unemployment rate, the highest of the big cities Attorney in Canada. General, come to order. You are putting thousands of jobs at risk in London at places like shame. Alliance Eye Communications. Shame, shame, shame. Windsor has a 9.3 per cent unemployment rate, a little better than London but still failing badly under the McGuinty, Wynne, Horvath government, and you're putting good jobs at risk there too. Premier, was a decision to kill the apprenticeship tax credit and risk up to 25,000 important Order, jobs please. your decision, or was it forced upon you by your NDP puppet masters? Before, uh, before I go to the answer, I'm going to ask the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek to come together, and if there's a continuation of the dialogue, I'm going to ask you to look up the old British way of saying it, take it outside. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite also should be aware that we highlighted this initiatives in the 2012 budget. We recognize and ask those very companies to come forward with more uh, advancements and, and, and be more productive in terms of supporting those employees. Now, 
We also want to make reference to the fact that the, um, these tax credits did existed, came into being prior to us making substantive tax reductions for corporates, making tax reforms to make them even more competitive. We want to ensure that the environment in which these businesses operate is a competitive environment, but also is to the benefit of those employees and those individuals. We want these companies to stay in Ontario. We want these companies to provide and to serve, but we want the people that are being employed to get the benefit of why we're investing in them. And that's not occurring at this point, so we want to take the proper steps going forward. Thank you. And the question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The MPP for London Fanshawe wrote a letter to her minister of uh, to the Premier's Minister of Correctional Services three weeks ago, asking her to provide a progress report about dangerous conditions at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre. Instead of progress, we learned that another correctional services officer was attacked, in fact stabbed in the head, over the weekend at the EMDC. To this day, the minister has still not responded to the letter that was sent by the member for London Fanshawe. Will the Premier take real and immediate action to protect the lives of workers and inmates in Ontario jails that immediately? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker. We answer all letters in the most uh, speedy way. And uh, I uh, don't know, I'm not aware when this letter was sent, but I'll make sure that we answer uh, the letter. And as I said uh, previously, you know, the health and safety are, are of both our correctional officer and our inmate are my priority. And I've been, <clears throat> I've been working very diligently with uh, my uh, deputy minister and uh, the ministry staff to improve the situation there. So we have developed a 12-point plan and we are in the process of putting it in, uh, in action. And also, we have now the 24 hours nursing yeah, as it was uh, required, good. which very is good. a good, uh, good progress. And we have Answer. approved uh, the hiring of uh, 11 new correctional officers. Yep. And very in good. the supplementary, I'll go on to Thank you. express supplementary. what you're doing. Thank you. Well, the letter was sent three weeks ago, Speaker, and uh, perhaps if it was speedily dealt with, this uh, injury could have been avoided this past weekend. The Elgin Middlesex Jail is just the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately, Speaker. In the last three days, four correctional officers have been stabbed in jails in Ontario, two in Niagara, one in Maplehurst to Milton, and one in London. Dangerous conditions in jails across the province continue to endanger the lives of workers and inmates, yet your minister cannot find the time to take action to actually correct the problems. Seems to be some giggling on the other side, Speaker. It's quite disconcerting. Premier, will you take action immediately to secure Ontario jails for the safety of the workers and the inmates who are there? Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we have uh, improved the situation there. I know that this incident is unfortunate, and it's unfortunate when a correctional officer yeah. is being, uh, you know, uh, attacked and uh, hurt. And uh, so, it's, it, uh, we take it very, very seriously. So, but the question remain, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm told, and uh, the, uh, they have improved the, uh, the. Uh, the, the situation thereby, uh, making sure that they do their wrong, that uh, you know everybody that comes in is uh, an investigated, and to make sure that they don't have they don't have drug, they don't have uh, matches, they don't have lighter, they don't have uh, knife. But the question remains, and that's what I ask my uh, my staff to answer the question: Why this is happening? Yes, Whose fault it is, and who should uh, make sure that this does not happen? To make sure that the other correctional officer are safe when they are working in the institution. Thank, Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hamilton East Stony Creek will come to order. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. This spring has been a spe specifically devastating for many mis municipalities across the province that have experienced severe flooding. Uh, homes and businesses have been damaged or destroyed in places such as Minden Hills, Mark Stay Warren, and in Moosonee. This flooding has resulted in significant damage to municipal infrastructure, but has also meant that many Ontarians have lost their possessions and their homes. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what the government is doing to help the people of Ontario who have experienced flooding and may have lost their homes? 
Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. This has been an extraordinarily difficult spring for a number of municipalities across Ontario, and I want to extend my condolences for those individuals who have lost possessions or their homes or their businesses during the flooding. I want to recognize the hard work of the residents, of the staff and of here, first here. responders in some of the affected communities in Bracebridge, Huntsville, Bancroft, uh, Kawartha Lakes, Minden Hills, South Algonquin, Marks de Warren, Ramara, and Moosonee, and I want to offer them my heartfelt thanks for all their hard work. Exactly. I've Thank you, Speaker. And I've had the opportunity to meet with the Mayor of Bracebridge and the Mayor of Huntsville, and I've seen firsthand the devastating impact the flooding has had on their communities. That's why last week our government committed up to $18 million through the Ontario Disaster Relief Assistance Program to help those affected communities across central, eastern, Answer. and northern parts of Ontario. The money will help them clean up, repair their homes and small businesses, and help them rebuild essential municipal infrastructure like bridges and roads. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. It's good to hear that there is action being taken to help rebuild after these devastating floods. Absolutely. When disasters like this happen, families are often caught off guard, and they often lose many of their possessions in addition to their homes. Families and individuals are in desperate need to replace essential items like clothing, shelter, food, or medicine. Some of the basic items that we take for granted, but they are essential items that every Ontarian needs to continue to live their lives. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us if there's any new initiatives being taken to assist those who may have lost so much because of the recent flooding in their community? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for the question because it's one that's been raised with me uh, before. While committing the $18 million to help communities rebuild, we've also been working hard to help those affected Ontarians recover from the disaster. Affected municipalities and their appointed disaster relief committees can give interim payments to residents of up to $1,000 to help them begin the process of recovery. That's good. Moreover, if an individual is in need of immediate financial need, they may be eligible to receive emergency assistance through Ontario Works. This emergency assistance gives individuals immediate financial assistance they need because of a crisis or an emergency situation such as flooding. The amount uh, provided may include money for basic needs such as food, uh, shelter, clothing, and I want to reassure all those affected that our government continues to work with the municipal partners to help residents and all the affected yes, municipal recover. That's Thank great. you. Great. New question. Great the question member here. Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, over the last decade, the Liberal government is responsible for chasing 300,000 manufacturing jobs out of the province. Your budget even shows that you've tried to make up for this loss by adding hundreds of thousands of public sector jobs to the government payroll. Now your government is threatening even more manufacturing jobs by trying to get rid of the industrial exception. I've heard loud and clear from manufacturers across the Quinty region that this is a serious concern for them and not just keeping jobs, but it's threatening the closure of these facilities as well. Premier, will you get off the back of the manufacturers of the province and stop trying to make government the only growth industry in Ontario? Attorney General. Thank you very much, and I know that the member spoke to his Chamber of Commerce about this issue last week, so I, I appreciate the, the heads up on the question. Uh, as I've already indicated to the member from Dufferin Peel, Caledon, Dufferin Caledon, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Speaker, that uh, we, I was not satisfied with the overall uh, consultation that took place. We have therefore put the matter on hold. Uh, we are doing our own consultation within the ministry right now, dealing with the industrial exemptions, uh, uh, speaking, uh, Speaker, that has been on the books since 1984, and we will be dealing with this issue uh, before when the first the of September. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, the last thing that manufacturers in the Quinty area need is more consultation yep. from this government. You know, it's consultation that's going to lead to a strategy that's probably never going to be implemented. This government, with the help of their NDP farm team, are killing manufacturing across Ontario. A Trenton VP of a manufacturing facility wrote you and me, Minister, uh, saying that currently they estimate the cost of doing business in Ontario is 30 per cent higher than the rest of Canada. And she estimates that if this exception, which as you say has been in place for almost 30 years, 
it'll add another 30 percent or more to the cost of doing business. Manufacturers need room to innovate. They need less red tape, not more. They need the competitive advantage that this exception gives Ontario. So Premier, either keep the industrial exception for the manufacturers in place or tell the workers that are working today that you're not interested in keeping their jobs in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. I'll refer the matter to the uh, Minister of uh, Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Minister of Economic Development, you, Trade Mr. and Speaker, Employment. Mr. Speaker, I have to say it continues to be disappointing that the official opposition, that the only role that they take is to berate and beat down our manufacturers and our businesses that are working so hard across this province, and particularly. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Um, if you carry on, you won't have a chance to say it. Attorney General will come to order. The member from the member from Lambton Kent Middlesex will come to order. The Minister of Rural Affairs will come to order. Next ones, next ones are warnings are out. Carry on, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I have to say that when you look at the facts, we've created over 400,000 jobs since the bottom of the recession, and for our manufacturers alone. In April, April was one of the best months, and 9,000 new manufacturing jobs were created in this province. When you look back at the 400,000 jobs created, Mr. 97% of those jobs are full-time positions. More than half of them are in the private sector. Your question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Eight years uh, after the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act was passed, people with disabilities continue to be denied service at restaurants and stores in cities like Toronto and Windsor. Advocates fear the government is failing to properly implement and enforce the Act. In fact, the law requires the minister appoint an independent review panel by May 31st to review impl implementation of the Act and get Ontario back on schedule for full accessibility. Has he done that? Oh, yeah. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member opposite for this uh, very relevant and important question. And I know she's as proud as I am of the AODA, the Accessibility yeah. for Ontarians with Disabilities Act that was passed in this legislature in 2005. In fact, it was Ontario it was one of the first jurisdictions that she knows in the world to actually go from a complaints-based regime to a uh, more proactive regulatory regime. So we reviewed, as was required under the legislation uh, several years ago, I think the report actually was presented in 2010. The reviewer at that time was Charles Beer, and I'm happy in the supplementary as well to talk about specifically what his recommendations were and how we've uh, moved both on those and the specific question that the member Thank opposite you, the member for Hay Park in the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I repeat, the minister is to appoint an independent review panel by May 31st, and he has not done that. In effect, this government is breaking its own law. Mm. It's, in fact, also promised to effectively enforce the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, and it's not doing that either. Companies with more than 20 employees are supposed to have reported their customer service policies to the ministry by now, but the minister won't say how many companies have actually filed these mandatory reports. Why is the minister refusing to provide this basic information and breaking the law by not setting up the independent review? Minister. Well, as the member opposite uh, has indicated, is that the uh, the disability the OADA requires a review every three years. Now, when we reviewed back in 2010, again Charles Beer, a very uh, uh, outstanding reviewer, actually re recommended strongly that we delay the next review until 2014, to the spring of 2014. Mr. Speaker, we're not going to do that. We've decided that this is important. That we're going to we're going to review this this year. We're in the process of determining the scope of that review again, based on Charles Beer's recommendations in 2010. We're, so we're actually moving faster than his recommendations Answer. to do this, to appoint a reviewer, determine the scope. I look forward to having an announcement in the, not, in the very near future. Thank you. The member from Simple Gray on a point of order. Speaker, I'd ask all members to welcome Mr. Matthew Thornton, 
who is in the uh, Speaker's Gallery today. Matthew served all parties in this House as a former legislative page and is a, uh, currently on the staff of the Ontario Real Estate Association. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And if the legislature would indulge me, I'd like to introduce the whole family. Uh, the dad, Frederick, and mom, Lynn Ho, and daughters, Larissa, Stephanie, Elizabeth, and son, Matthias. Welcome, hey. to, welcome to the legislature. Just before I turn to the member from Cambridge, I'll, I'll correct the record because he was my intern too, so he was an intern. Thank you. The member from Cambridge. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with the uh, theme of these point of orders, I recognize uh, Professor Hank Jasics here today with his graduate class from McMaster University who are here to learn about government and politics in, on in Ontario, and I look forward to talking to them later today. Speaker and I again. I did this earlier, but I'd like to recognize yet another Michael Harris who did work here at Queens Park, and he he and his class are here from OSCBI. Thank you, Speaker. I, uh... I beg to inform the House that I have laid upon the table the uh, 2012 annual report of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. There are no further, there are no deferred votes. This house stands recessed until three o'clock this afternoon. Three.